How's everybody doing? Uh-oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, are we good? All right, well, welcome. Glad you're here tonight. Um, let, let me pray. Lord, we just thank you so much that we can gather together, Lord, that we can be here tonight and... I pray, Lord, that you would um, come fill this place, Lord. I know it's been a a cold day, Lord. There's been a little snow in the air. (laughs) And um, I just want to lift up this evening to you, Lord, and just would ask that you would work in our hearts and lives and that your word would come alive, Lord, that you would bless our worship time and um, just bless our time tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. uh, We're going to just start... With a little video in just a second. But, um, you know, the youth group tonight is at the Jesus Revolution movie. And um, I tried, I wanted to take the whole church, okay? I wanted to take the whole church. But the AMC theater in town is still broken down. And so the thing is, I signed up because you can get, Calvary Pastors got these free tickets. And I, but I signed up for the AMC Burlington Theater. And then it never opened again, you know, it's still not open. So, um, so I kind of had made this decision to send the youth group all the way to Bellingham. So, um, and the Calvary Chapel in Bellingham is there tonight too. So they have a full theater and, um, and I, you know what, I'm getting really excited about this film now. I haven't seen it. So it's kind of hard to promote a film that you haven't seen because there may be some things, but you know, it's really the story of, of the Jesus movement and Chuck Smith and, and Greg Laurie and Lonnie Frisbee and, and just kind of how these things kind of started, how Chuck started reaching out to the hippies. And, um, and you know, Greg Laurie normally puts out a pretty phenomenal um, message. So. And tonight, af- after the show's over, he's going to actually, he's not going to be there in Bellingham, but he's going to be on the theater and he's going to share the gospel. So, um, so it's only tonight I heard that he's going to do that. So I don't know if he's going to do that all the time, but um, just it's because it's not it's not actually out yet. This is kind of a pre thing that churches got. So, um, but yeah. So let's can we pray real quick for the youth in that? And so yeah, let's pray. Lord, I just want to pray for the youth, Lord, tonight, and uh, the other churches that are part of the Jesus Revolution tonight. Um, we pray, Lord, as they're watching it even right now, Lord, we pray that you would speak to their hearts, that you would gather them, that you'd bring them to you, Lord. And as Greg shares the gospel at the end, if there's anyone who, who doesn't know you, we know there's going to be people there that don't know you, Lord. I pray that they would turn to you, that you would do a work in their lives and hearts. And, um, and even those who know you, Lord, we pray that this would just ignite a fire in their hearts this evening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to just watch a quick little three-minute film. Yeah. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are
Awesome. There we go, yeah. 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 Yeah, he was on Kelsey Grammer was on Jimmy Fallon. He was on Kelly Ripa and he started crying. And I think he started crying because of this. Because I, I know a lot of people have come up to Kelsey Grammer and said, Pastor Chuck, here's what he meant to me. And I think Kelsey Grammer's realizing he's playing this part of this pastor who touched so many people's lives, and, and he's realizing, you know, that Hollywood is so empty, and Kelsey Grammer said, I wanted to do something that was worthwhile, I wanted to do something that meant something, and now he is, and so I think the Lord is really working on Kelsey Grammer, Frazier. <laughs> you know, when, when they first started doing this project, do you guys know who the comedian Jim Gaffigan is? They were going to, they asked him. But, they, but it didn't work out. They asked Kelsey Grammer, and so there it is. But it's, you guys, I, listen, I encourage you, you can't go in Burlington because the theater is closed, but they're playing it. Um, you got to go soon um, because movies like this, if, if they don't get enough people going, they just, they'll, they'll, they'll pass on them. So it's, I know in, in Bellingham, it's start on Friday, it's playing, um, and uh, so I don't know. I, I'm excited about how the how God's going to use it, right? It's awesome. So, and I also, before we worship, I want you know I was thinking about this today as this Jesus Revolution movie's coming out, and it was really, you know, God's Spirit moved. You know, it wasn't Pastor Chuck, it wasn't Ray Glory, it wasn't Lonnie Frisbee. God's Spirit moved and touched people's hearts and lives. And um, you know, the, there's the Ash, Ashbury Revival, have you heard, Asbury Revival, have you been hearing about this? And, you know, at first, I've got to be honest, because it happened about a week ago, I think, or maybe 10 days ago now, and I was a little skeptical of this. And I think it's okay to be a little skeptical. You know, with these college students, they're worshiping, they just didn't stop worshiping, and, and um, I thought, you know what, I'm going to watch a little of it. And I started watching it, and I was really blessed. It touched my heart. Number one, they were just worshiping. But then I, one of the college professors got up there and, and shared, and I really was blessed by what he, what he said, is he said, you know what, a lot of people are calling this a revival, and it's not a revival yet. It's just God's moving in the students here at this, at this, on this campus, and then it's kind of spread to these other campuses. And I'll tell you, you know, he, he said, how many of you are 25 or younger? And almost the entire crowd raised their hand. You know, and so um, there's always going to be a little weird things probably that come out of this. <laughs> there always is. But right now, it's, it's pretty awesome. I, I also watched another clip where they were worshiping and then they re were repenting of sins. And I'll tell you, when I was watching that, the Lord kind of touched my heart. And, 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 you know, there was a few things I needed to repent of. And that, that's so good, you know, when, when we kind of have that heart so I, I, I'm, I'm personally, I'm kind of excited about this because it's finally, there's finally something like good in the news. <laughs> and so I, just, I would just ask you to be praying for this movie. I encourage you to go see it and, and pray for, pray for the, you know, these college students that are, you know, be, <laughs> it's awesome. Pray for that and, and, and watch some of it, you know. You know, the difference between the Jesus movement and Jesus revolution and this, I would say just one thing is, do you notice in, the, in that film, they were raising up their Bibles? And there's, there's a huge emphasis on, on this worship right now, which is good. But, you know, in the Jesus movement, and they, they had the Word of God, too, and we need that, too. But anyways, let's, let's stand and pray. You guys come up. Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing, how you're moving, Lord. I, I do pray for the college students. I pray for young people, youth. And we lift them to you, Lord. And we just ask that you would move in people's hearts and lives and and even right now, Lord, as the students, again, are watching this film and as others are watching this film, we pray for it, Lord, that you would work through it and that you would use it as a tool to bring people to church, to bring people to you, ultimately, Lord, and for all of us to repent of our sins. And as Daniel and Mandy come to lead us in some songs, Lord, we pray that you would come and minister to our hearts. And we just give this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Before we started, we wanted to read a passage that goes along with the first song that we're singing, and it's from Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 6. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Men of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, who in sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood, hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, helpless, lost were we, blameless Lamb of God was He, sacrificed to set us free, hallelujah, what a Savior, He was lifted up to die, it is finished was his cry now in heaven exalted high hallelujah what a savior hallelujah what a savior hallelujah what a savior when he comes a glorious King, all his ransomed home to bring. Then anew this song will sing, hallelujah, what a Savior, hallelujah, what a Savior, hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransomed hope to bring, then anew this song will sing, hallelujah, what a Savior.
You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. And all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love, you bring life. To the darkness you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Worthy is the Lamb who was saved, holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Worthy is the Lamb who was saved, holy, holy is he. Sing a new song 
To him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Clothed in rainbows of living color, Flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Filled with wonder, heartstruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing Praise to the King of Kings, you are my everything, and I will adore you. Worthy is the Lamb who was saved. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Oh, dear God, just thank you for this time of worship, Lord. Thank you for this time of gathering together. And we just pray that you bless Brian's sermon tonight, Lord, and Give us ears that hear and hearts that accept the things that you have to tell us tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hit the lights, too. All right. Well, let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 9. And we've been making our way through Revelation. We're in chapter 9. <laughs> All right. Well, as we've been studying Revelation chapter 9, these last few chapters, the tribulation, talking about tribulation, it's been a time where it's a time when God is going to pour out his wrath 
on an unbelieving world. It's judgment is happening, and, and we're going to see that again in our text today. And essentially, God is going to make all thing, all right, the things right that have been so wrong. And remember, we had these seven seals that were, that when a seal was broken, something happened on the earth. And then we, we started last week, the seven, we had these trumpets, these three trumpets, or the, the seven trumpets, and we're going to look at the last three trumpets today. And I I talked about, you know, when trumpets were blown in the Old Testament times, it was, it was to warn people. It was a call, call people to war. It was, you know, it was, it was an announcement. And that's what we see happening here. And these last three trumpets, they bring such terrible things on earth that these are called the three woes. <laughs> and... You know, as we've been studying this part of Revelation, maybe you thought, maybe have you thought, can it get any worse? And um, I mean, think about it. We've seen that those martyred for their faith, um, the destruction of land. We've seen destruction of sea. We've seen the destruction of rivers. It affected the drinking water. We see these meteorites falling. We see the sun darkened. We see ships of the sea being destroyed. And just when you think it couldn't get any worse, you have to kind of brace yourself because it's going to get completely insane. <laughs> and I just want to draw your attention to the last verse in the end of chapter 8. Look what it ended with these words. It says, And I looked and I heard an angel flying. It's verse 13 of chapter 8. And through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Because the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. And so this angel's message is woe, woe, woe. And you know, the, the, the word woe is an interesting word. It, it's what I always think of a horse when you say woe to stop, right? Um, it remind me of a story. There was a guy and he bought a Christian horse. And he was told two important things before he bought this horse. He says, you can't forget this. He says, if you want the horse to go, you say, praise the Lord. And if you want the horse to stop, you say, hallelujah. And so no sooner he got home, he's out for a ride, and he's off and running, and, and, and suddenly man noticed a cliff, and he couldn't remember how, how to say, how to tell the horse to stop. And so he, you know, he's like, whoa, stop, play dead, God loves you. And right before he's about to, you know, go over the edge, he remembered, hallelujah. He says, hallelujah. And the, and the horse came to a complete stop right at the edge. And the guy was so relieved, he said, praise the Lord. <laughs> so that's one way to use the word woe. <laughs> um, and, and in a sense, it's kind of true because it's, it's, it's woe, like make this stop, this judgment that's coming, you know. But another word is, is kind of like Wow. Like, whoa, surfers, guys in heaven, whoa, <laughs> check it out, or something. <laughs> but really what, what we see here is it's, it's that the word really means watch out, in a sense. It's be, get ready, beware, you know, and that's what we see here. This, it's very intense. I mean, Jesus said in Luke 21, 26, it says, men's hearts would fail them from fear and anticipation of those things which are coming to the earth. And so Revelation is anything but a bedtime reading story. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny. These are not our memorizing verses that we read here. It's not the verses we write down in our promise book or whatever. Um, but I guess just to sum it up, things are going to get really, really bad. And, and so, it, it, again, it goes from, from war and famine and death and earthquakes. In chapter 9, it gets even worse. And we might even say hell literally breaks out here on this earth. Let me just read the first 12 verses here. It says, Then the fifth angel sounded, and a star fell from heaven to earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and a smoke rose out of the pit like smoke of a great furnace. So the sun of the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. And then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. And to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or the green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. 
Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. And in those days, men will seek death, will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like faces of men. And had hair like women's hair, and teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and their stings were, were in their tails. Their power was made to hurt men for five months. And they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon. But in Greek, he is named Alpalon. One woe is past. Behold, still more woes are coming after these things. So in these first few verses that we're covering today, or tonight, it's divided really in, in these four sections. We have this falling star. Notice we, there's a pit and that's opened, and this, this horde is unleashed, and, and the world is, is in unnerved. And, and if you just go back to verse 1, it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And, you know, remember in chapter 8, there was a star that we read about in chapter 8, and, and this is different here. I mean, this star has a kind of a personality. It says, to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And also notice that it's, it's, it's not speaking of a falling star, but it literally a star had fallen in, in, the, in the tents. And as I mentioned before, you know, sometimes when we, when we read Re- Revelation, there's times where we have to say, well, is this figuratively or is this symbolic? Is this literal, right? And I love, I love the Bible because I love how it most often it answers those questions for us, right? It literally speaks of an event that already happened. It, it literally speaks of an event that already happened and, and an event that happened in an earlier date. It, it has, you know, the, these lingering results. And it said a star had fallen. Well, this most Bible commentators believe is none other than Satan himself. You know, and if, if, if you're taking notes, Isaiah 14 tells about his fall. And here's what it says. In Isaiah 14, 12, it says, How have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn? You've been cut down to the earth. You have been weakened by the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north, and ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. And that's, you know, what Satan said, and that's what he did. And and then he responded, nevertheless, this is how God responds, nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol to the recesses of the pit. Right? Jesus, he also spoke about this event in in Luke chapter 10. He said, "Uh, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Jesus spoke about this. And so we learn from scriptures like these that Satan was, you know, we know that he was an angelic being. Um, he was involved in, most likely, in worship. He, you know, he wanted to raise himself above God. And his heart, of course, was filled with pride. And he got the boot out of heaven. And, and, and this, you know, just and on a practical level, this can happen to anybody who's being used by the Lord, you know? start to think that everything kind of evolves around them, and, and that's always a big mistake, you know. If it's always focused on you and you think, you know, I, I'm great and all this stuff, and the, see, the goal of the Christian is always to become less centered, right, and more God-centered, and that's our, that should be our goal, Christ-centeredness. And when you lose your life for Christ, for Christ's sake, that's when you really start to live, and, but so we, we have to beware of pride, because pride can set it in in any of us. But as a result of him, him being cast out of heaven, we know in Revelation chapter 12, a third of the, the angels, a third of the stars were cast out with him. And so he, he took a third. We don't know how many that is. We, we, it doesn't tell us. In, in verse 11, he's called the name in Hebrew, Abaddon, but in the Greek, Apollyon. And both these, both these are, are transliterated like destroyer. You know, just that's what they, these words mean, destroyer. You know, in the Bible, 
names have meaning, right? And, and so, like, you know, you can learn a lot from names like, you know, Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua, you know, Messiah or Savior, um, Abraham, the father of many, that's certainly what he was. Um, Enoch, I mean, dedicated. Lucifer, it meant, light, in Latin, just light bearer. Lucifer. Satan means opposition, you know, contrary to be opposed. It's, it's, that's what he's about. He's, he's, he's an opposition. That's what the word Satan means. And, and this destroyer, you know, opposition, destroyer. And, and that's his game plan. You know, he, 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 you know, anything in our lives that the Lord is seeking to build, Satan wants to destroy. He wants to oppose. He wants to bring down. And, and that's his nature, to kill, to rob, and destroy. If you want to try to build a home with Christian principles, he wants to destroy that. He's, he's just trying to destroy that right now, right, in our society. He comes against those things. That's who he is. You know, in John 10.10, 10, it says um, he's come to kill, rob, and destroy. But then Jesus says, but I have come to give life and life more abundantly. You know, let's see the contrast. <laughs> the contrast. What a contrast. I, 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 listen, Satan is not your friend. <laughs> He's not your friend. I don't know if any of you saw or just read the news because probably none of us watched the Grammys a couple weeks ago. You know, they said, it's time to worship. And then they had all this satanic stuff going on and, you know, this devil-type, demon-type weird stuff. Did you guys see that? Anybody read about it? Yeah. Crazy. I think the craziest part, they said, now it's time to worship. I mean, that's who they worship in Hollywood. I mean, it's, it shouldn't surprise us, but that's, it's, it's just gross, the stuff. One commentary said, the word devil, you take away D, is evil. <laughs> you take away D-E, it's vile. And you take away D-E-V, it's ill. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to make us ill. Vile, evil, vile, ill. That's what he, he wants to make us sick. And it is sick, isn't it? Look at verse 2. It says, And he opened the bottomless pit. I just kind of picture the smoke arose out of the pit and smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. The, the phrase bottomless pit, pit is actually, in the Greek, it's abuzo. Maybe you've heard that before. It appears seven times in the book of Revelation. It's a, it's a, if a, it's a reference to the abode, uh, you know, uh, you know where, where we would believe these incarcerated demons are. You know, it just, it, this abode, this, this abuso. And it tells us that Satan himself is going to be locked up there for a thousand years. And, but he's going to be let loose for a season at some point in time and but then thrown into the lake of fire. You know, as a matter of fact, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it speaks of this group. It says, For God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness is to be reserved for judgment. So we have this group, these angelic beings who sinned, and there's this place reserved for them for judgment. What was their sin? Well, Jude, if you're taking notes, verse 6, it says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. Interesting, huh? He is reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, and in a similar manner, these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And if you put some of the passages together, you know, it's, we're told that there's this group of angels who sinned, and in a, in a sense it angered God. And so they left their domain, and, and their, 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 their sin was reminiscent of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he cast them down, he threw them into this pit. It's like demon jail, I guess. 
And this is something the demons fear. Um, for those of us that are going to Israel, we're going to get to this place, again, Sard. It's the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Galilee. And it's, you remember that, that the demons begged Jesus to not send them into the abyss. So he beg, they, they begged him that they, that they would just, you know, that he would not send them into the abyss, the pit. But back to Revelation here, it says Satan unlocks this pit, smoke comes out, darkens the sun, this kind of eerie scene with probably eerie music going on in the background. <laughs> and then this horde is unleashed, verse 3, and out of the smoke the locust came to the earth and to them was given power, as scorpions of the earth have power, and they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or green thing or the tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like a torment of scorpion when it strikes a man. I told you these aren't memorization verses, but the locusts, you know, the locusts are used some 22 times in the Bible, and they're always in, in, in a form of judgment when locusts come. It's a form of judgment. And you think of locusts, they travel in masses, they're small, but they, but they have mass destruction, right? And these, but these aren't normal locusts. <laughs> I mean, notice what they eat. It says, you know, normal, normal locusts, what do they eat? Grass, crops, trees, green vegetation, but these locusts, it says they feast on people. And they, it also in verse 11, it says they have a king over them, an angel of, of the bottomless pit. It's interesting because locusts have no king. You know, the real locusts, unlike bees or ants, they have no king, they have no queen. But these locusts have a king. <laughs> interesting. And then their appearance, verse 7. The shape of a locust was they were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. And they had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and they, the sound of their wings was like a thousand chariots with many horses running into battle. And they had tails like scorpions, and their sting and their tails and their power was to hurt men five months. You know, you imagine if all the prisons across our country just were let open and all the criminals were just set free, the chaos, how chaotic that would be. This is almost worse. This is worse. <laughs> I mean, this is worse than that. This is, this is bad. It says there, in, the, in their description, it says their shape was like horses prepared for battle. It speaks of power. It speaks of defiant, eager charge in their mission. Their faces were like men. It speaks of, I think, almost like their intelligence. They may be rational in, the, in their deception. Um, their hair is like women's hair. Um, maybe there's a beauty to them, right? Teeth like lions, able to devour, to tear apart. They bite. Breastplates of iron, they're, they're indestructible. They have, their wings are like chariots. They have this ability to travel at high speed. You know, some, some commentators will say these are helicopters, you know. But, but I don't, I, the reason I don't see that is because they, it tells us five times that they get to torment, they get to inflict, but they can't kill, you know. And, you know, most, they say a lot of scorpions aren't actually deadly you know, they don't kill you, you know, unless you're maybe a small child, but it's like the torment, the sting is like, it's unbearable type thing. They affect your nervous system. They don't kill, but they make you go crazy in a sense. And notice something else about Satan and his horde of demons. The power is limited because Satan's given a key to the buso, which means he can't open it anytime he wants. You know, but there's a time when, when God permits. And, and then it says, for it's, this is going to happen for a short season, five months. They're not allowed to kill, but they're just allowed to torment. Crazy. And one thing I think we always need to 
keep in proper perspective when talking about Satan is that he's not even close to God. And God's the creator. And Satan and his demons, they're created beings. They're fallen angels. I mean, God, he's all-powerful. You know, God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Satan, has his power is limited. He can only do what God allows when God allows him to do it. You know, it's interesting when you study that Jesus and you study him in the Gospels and he encounters these demons. You notice when Jesus ever comes on the scene, they tremble. They don't want anything to do with Jesus. You know, when Jesus spoke, they, they, they're out of there. <laughs> You know, in all the cases in, in uh, de- not demonic possession in the New Testament, you'll find nowhere where someone's demon-possessed who was a believer, you know. After meeting Jesus, I mean, they're gone. <laughs> they are gone. See, because Jesus, uh, demons, they don't want to be where Jesus is. They're in total submission to him. You know, I just say, if, you know, if you're a Christian, that means that the Holy Spirit lives inside you. He, he, he will not allow you to be demonic, possessed. You know, they can't coexist exist there. But God is, allow, is all-knowing. Satan's not. And, and he, Satan, he can't read our mind, I don't think. And God loves us. And he, you know, the Lord, he loves us so much. And his desire is, is, is righteousness in us. And he's always present. Did you think about that? God is always present. And Satan's not. But they're given this power for five months. And, and now after reading that, I mean, it's crazy, right? Can we just all agree to that? After reading that, wouldn't you, wouldn't you think that people would say, okay, enough is enough. I, you know, I, I, I don't want any more of this. I want you, Lord. We'll skip to verse 20. Revelation 9, 20, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by the plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. They did not repent of their murderers, of their sorcerers, or their sexual morality, or their thefts. They didn't repent. Again, it's... It just amazes me when I read this chapter. And in verse 6 again, too, it just says, you know, men will seek death and not find it. They'll desire to die. Death will not come. You know, I, I just... Crazy. And, and, and here's the crazy part, too, is this isn't the worst thing I mean, it's just, it's just gonna, it's just this judgment of God is being poured out, and, and it's a, it's a little hell for those who reject Christ. And, and I just think about this, though. Sometimes I think as Christians we need to consider this: is can you imagine being in eternity in hell? You know, sometimes I meet or listen to people who, you know, they have a testimony about maybe how much they gave up to follow Christ and they maybe have a long list of stuff. And, and yet all, see, all the stuff, it's all going to perish. It's all going to perish. And I think, what did we really give up? We gave up hell and torment is what we gave up. It's not, it's not what we gave up. It's what God has redeemed us from. He wants all to repent. That's his heart. He wants people to repent. And he goes through great lengths to try to get people to repent, to turn from their sins. 
So we don't have to go through that. God, Jesus, he died for us. He died for our sins. He took it upon himself. And I, I, I guess I just, I want to end on a little bit of a positive note. Because I, I think when I, when I read about this, I, I just have to remember that we are in a battle. We're in a battle. And we have spiritual weapons. <laughs> you know, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil is we are called to put on the armor of God. You know, when, 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 mil, when a military goes into battle, they're equipped. I mean, how silly would it be to not, not be equipped? Just to show up and be, you know, hey, I'm in, in some Bermuda shorts and a, and a Hawaiian shirt. You know, that'd be silly. <laughs> you know, they, they come equipped. And, and God, he's given us weapons. And I just want to look at two of them tonight for the sake of time. You know, I think of the first one really just purity, righteousness. You know, the, 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 the demonic locust couldn't touch the 144,000 that had God's seal on them. You know, in 1 John 5.18, it says, We know that whatever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself from the wicked one does not touch him. And I think it's interesting in that same sentence, John is encouraging his readers not to sin. Not to sin. And he connects somehow Satan's powerlessness against us. And I think when we yield ourselves to sin, we're given Satan a place to grab onto us. Isn't that true? It's like we're kind of like attaching handles, you know, or, you know, and, but when we learn to say no to sin, you know, I think that's part of just growing as a Christian. We learn to say no to sin, and it's like coating ourselves with Teflon. He, he just can't, he can't get a grip on us. You know, when we get to Revelation chapter 14, we're going to see the 144,000. They, they, they had this reputation of purity, of purity, and the demons couldn't touch them. They were, it says they were not defiled in, in Revelation 14. The second armor, I think, is prayer that I wanted to talk about tonight is, you know, Jesus gives us prayer to bind the devil you know, to cast him away. We see Jesus doing this in the scriptures. We see him demonstrating his authority when he spoke. And Jesus, you know, they couldn't stand against him. <laughs> and when we bring Jesus into it, it's like they just couldn't stand against him and, and they, they yielded to Christ. And I think sometimes... Our battle is in prayer. And when we learn to walk in purity, you know, Satan has less and less chance to trip us up. But we also need to be in prayer. We need to, you know, be praying for our own hearts, but be praying for this world. Be praying, praying, praying. We need to be praying. Guys, just last thing, too, is we have Jesus on our side. <laughs> Sometimes we forget that, right? It's, we're not just alone. We have Jesus with us. You know, when, when your cell phone rings and you see Satan's collar on the caller ID, <laughs> we don't have to be scared. We, we just, I think we just have to yell out and call out to Jesus. You know, I, I don't think we, we should be afraid of what's ahead. I think we just need to, to cling to Jesus. And um, so let's pray right now. Lord, these are sobering chapters in the Bible. Lord, of what's 
this judgment that's going to come upon this earth, Lord. And I, I pray that right now you would help us. Lord, because sometimes we, we live in this world and we, we, we don't know what to do and we want to grow closer to you, but it's just hard and we get drug back in from the world. just sucks us back in, Lord. And, and I just would pray tonight, Lord, that you would, that we would take time just to be with you, that we'd take time, Lord, to repent of our sins. And Lord, when we do that and we pray and we seek you, Lord, you do, you cover us, Lord. And we just even just invite your Holy Spirit to come and fill us up, Lord, to overflow our cup, Lord, because we need just a fresh feeling of your Holy Spirit even tonight because we have to walk into this gross world. So I just would ask, Lord, that you would convict us, that you would draw us near to you, that you'd be doing a mighty, mighty work in our lives, Lord. And I would pray for those that we've been praying for, Lord, that it almost seems like there's no hope. And I pray, Lord, that, that you would be pouring out your spirit on people's lives, Lord. For those who don't know you, Lord, that you would be speaking to them because we, Lord, we, don't, we know your heart is not for anybody to go to hell. You didn't make hell for people. The only reason they go there is by their own choice. It's not your choice, Lord. Your choice is to save them, is for them to repent, to turn to you. And so we pray, Lord, that, that you would use this church, that you'd use other churches, Lord, that you would use us as Christians to reach out to people, to share your truth. And we, we call upon you, Lord, and ask you to work a mighty work in our own hearts first, Lord, but in our families, in our children, in our grandchildren, in our neighbors, Lord, in our moms and dads and grandma and grandpas. We pray, Lord, that you would please be working. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.